Hi, folks. This is John, the Wingman Woman 5 channel. I'm sorry that Mr. Andy Tran cannot be with me this evening. He had a prior commitment, so I'm flying solo. This is my first solo show, but I have a guest. We finally are doing an international show all the way from New Brunswick, Canada, Mr. Wayne Russell. Wayne, welcome to the show this evening. Well, thank you there, Wingman. Uh, this is my first show like this as well, live stream. I'm not usually on live stream, so want to thank you for that. And yeah, it's should be a fun show. Yeah, it's going to be a fun night. And what what we're looking for is audience participation. So if you are joining us, we welcome you uh, to the live show. Uh, leave questions over on the side on the live chat, and I will uh, read them off uh, during the show. Uh, don't get too crazy. Keep it clean because there's kids that do watch the show, and we'll uh, we'll kick it off. We'll have a fun night. Uh, the Angry Jackalope has checked in. He's saying hello. Uh, he's a good friend of mine, Rob Ricks. Um, let's, let's start off about um, – Tell people about you, about where you're from, and a little bit about your YouTube channel and what's that about. Well, as you mentioned, I'm Wayne Russell, and I live in St. John, New Brunswick. And I've basically been in the forest. I grew up in the country, and I've been in the forest all my life. So I wanted to share that with other people. I've learned a few skills and such, so I created my YouTube channel, which is called Grape and Bushcraft. And that got me, you know, other people started seeing what I can do and so, such, and I don't now, know what else to say. <laughs> St. Jo John, New Brunswick, I grew up in Aroostook County up in northern Maine, so we're probably only about two and a half hour drive away from yeah. uh, each other from where I grew up in Portage Lake. Uh, so the woods is pretty similar yep. to, uh, to where I grew up. Probably a lot of cedar swamps, some bogs, a lot of spruce, a lot of fir, kind of like that, a little bit of boreal forest type stuff, would you say? Um, yeah, you know, that's what – mostly around here is it's fir spruce um cedar swamps birch we have birch mixed in around there as well and maples and such but to find a full stand of hardwood is very rare you it's mostly like i say fir and spruce that's what you're going through and once in a while you'll you will see a bunch of hardwood but it's it's Uncommon, really. I mean, a lot of it's been cut down, right? As you know, being in Maine, a lot of our forest has been clear cut, basically, you know, at one time or another, and the spruce and fir have taken over. Really? Yeah, it's really affected the, uh, like, the white tailed deer population in northern Maine, which is, they're, they're still around, but I mean, it's a, it's a rare sight to see a white tailed deer now. Uh, the black bear population has thrived with the clear cutting and moose have thrived. Uh, yeah. I'm sure that if they're doing the same practice over where you're at, it's probably the same situation there. We've got quite a few deer and uh, ours are all in the cities. <laughs> if you want to find a deer, man, you're going to your backyard in the city pretty much. That's, that's yeah. where, you know, to be honest, uh, we have around here, we have a lot of, uh, small towns or what you know what what you'd want to call them all around the city and they're full of deer they are they're full of deer but i mean there's still a bunch in the forest as well but there's a high population right in the towns of the cities around here actually yeah you're right about that because my mom uh, living in portage i mean every morning she gets up you know and i and i'll call her and she she goes, hey, I counted sixty five deer this morning coming through the yard, you know, stuff like that going down towards the lake, just because all all the old deer yards are kind of gone, and the game wardens up there are kind of like 
distract, you know, telling folks not to feed the deer because of uh, there's some sort of disease going through the herds and it's just infecting, you know, all these uh-huh. herds of deer because they're publicly yeah. feeding them, you know? Yeah. So yeah. it's just, it's just making the problem even worse. But uh, we're going to get into some questions here. One question from one of the viewers, and it's Bushcrafter1973. His question is, if you could only pick one knife that you would bet your life on, what knife would that be, Wayne? You know, it's kind of funny because the knife that I've used the most over the last couple years I'm not quite sure how long I've had it now, is the Strayed 52M, my Carta. That one there, the Strayed 52, I have used that for everything. And if there's such thing as a one-tool option, that would be it for me. Uh, You have to like big knives. And this one here, it's got to do a certain amount of things for me to be a one knife. It's got to be able to cut saplings to build shelter. It's got to be able to baton wood, which I beat through some pretty big wood with that, and it's never failed me. And I can even carve a spoon with it, so I can definitely, you know, do fine tasks. It's never let me down. So the Shred 52M, it feels good in the hand. It's a nice, beefy knife. It holds a good edge. and for the price, it's one of the better knives out there, in my opinion. Yeah, I had a chance to uh, review that blade, and you're right. I really like the handles on that on that knife. For being such a big knife, the handles were yeah. really ergonomic. Um, hey, we got Mike from Blue Mountain Bushcraft checked in. Hey, Mike, how you doing? Yeah, Mike. Good guy. Great channel, too. Check his channel out. Um, got a question for you about alone. I know that you can't talk too much about it. This is kind of just a general question. Just want to yeah. know what sort of emotion were you feeling when they dropped you on the beach and <laughs> saw the crew leaving? You know, I'm the type of person that I – I'm always, you know, I research areas and so on and so forth. I usually try to know every little ins and outs that could happen to me out there. And like I said, going in, the only thing that I actually worried about is finding enough food and the predators. As if, you know, my shelter, my fire, so on and so forth, those skills didn't, you know, worry at me at all. It was the predators and that. Now, when I was dropped off, I was, you know, I was fine, okay, let's game's on. I go in and I look at my gear. And then, you know, this was this was real. Uh, there they have the highest population of cougar. Yeah. In, you know, all North America. And the highest attack rate on humans as well. And I've heard of a few of them. And so basically, as I was dropped off, I walked in there. I had no clue if I'm going home or not. So I started thinking, you know, about family and such. And it started to get to me a little bit. And actually, as you see, I started to say something, then I shut up. And then I just, okay, game's on, let's get to it. And I just switched my mind. But that for a second, I felt, you know, because a cougar, you're walking along, next thing you know, you're in the dirt and they're crunching on the back of your neck. That's the way they attack. And uh, so you had no clue, you know, if you was actually, you know, what anything could happen. So you didn't know if you're going to leave that island or not. It was, uh, yeah, that, that made you think for a second. And then I just turned it on. You know, and then I was like, well, if it happens, it happens, let's get to it kind of thing, you know, and did what I had to do. I was fine then. I I think for a lot of folks, uh, like my buddy Brady from the Sydney School of Survival says, you know, it's not the creatures of the night that affect you, but the creatures of the mind 
most probably 98 percent of the time and i think you're exactly right on that that once you started having those thoughts that you just had to switch that off because yeah. once you go down that road it's hard to turn that bus around especially when it gets dark out there <laughs> and things are cracking and you know limbs break in and all that stuff and you're wondering what if, that uh, is. if you've seen that little clip the second night I actually uh, was laying in my shelter and I heard geese playing they came in on that bay that I was beside and that in that little cove and they're in there playing they're honking around and stuff all of a sudden I hear this splash and the goose going ah, ah, you know honking it's trying to flap but it can it's pin all of a sudden I hear a, a uh, growl you know, and instantly, 30 feet from down below me, I'm hearing this uh, cougar tearing apart a goose. Oh, wow. <laughs> and, I, and I'm laying in there just thinking, well, and if you see, it's going to be a long night kind of thing, but what can you do? I mean, I just, yeah. I just waited and listened and so on, and I was, you know, there's not much you can do. It's, I had a knife and some bear spray, and but... <laughs> Basically, it's there's nothing you do. You you just you know and basically the thing the thing is is when you go in there you know this stuff may happen and you go in there knowing this and hey, you just you got to be prepared for it. What, what can I say? I mean, mentally or whatever. I mean, yeah. If you're not in the game, I mean, you're gonna be. You're going to be out of the game quick if you don't have your mind right. That's for sure. Hey, we got a gentleman named David in the comments section. And his question is, what would you do differently if you could repeat the same adventure? Great question, David. I have to think on that one. <laughs> really, um, there's nothing that I... I can't say that I would do anything differently um, because I was my shelters, even that first one that I put up, it, it, I mean, I was dropped off late as you've seen the time and such. I put up a shelter. I was warm. I was dry. It was not pretty, but I was warm and dry. And the other, you know, nights that I was out there, I was warm and dry. And then I build a real nice shelter, and I had that going. And whenever I was never thirsty, I always had water. I was never hungry. I mean, as in those type of skills, I did everything I could. And as for the last my um, leaving, having to be rescued because that bear, you know, and such, uh, I had to make that decision because you know I was I was told to come home if your life is in danger. And it was either stay and most likely, you know, could have went really bad or go home because he was still out there. He had already charged me and he's still out there. So it's like, you know, he's not going away. So what's he looking for? You know, so anyway. Yeah, you know, folks that don't live in bear country, it, it's, it's a little scary. These bears are very territorial. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we, we deal a lot with black bears, you and I, uh, you know, when I was growing up on the East Coast. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't realize people, people get attacked by more black bears than any other bear. You yeah. Um, actually, black bears, and I, I heard this, I'm not positive, but I heard black bears and polar bears are the only ones that will hunt humans. And also a... A uh, black bear's territory is up to a hundred miles. You know, so you can't move. Uh, you know, if you if if you are a black bear sees you and he's already charged you, he wants you gone for one reason or another. This is his territory or whatever. He's challenging you or whatever. He wants you gone. You know, you back away and get out of that situation. You know, best you can. But the thing is, is that that bear. He's going to come back around, you know, next time. And, you know, and if you already back down, it makes him feel a little, still a little stronger, you yeah. know, inside. And the bear's going to take what they want to take, you know, you know that. I mean, if they feel oh, they yeah. can, 
So yeah, it's it, crazy. You grew up with bears. I grew up with bears. We know how they act. We know yeah. that basically if you're in a situation like that, you have to leave. Or if you don't have something that can be an equalizer, it could turn bad. Um, Rob Ricks from the Angry Jackalope has a question for you. He goes, what's the most important aspect of survival in your opinion? Now, you, you teach a lot of survival stuff. You have um, videos that you could download for folks uh, that are – that are looking to educate themselves. So this is a great question uh, to pick your brain on. I, I want to hear this one. Well, if, if I'm getting the question right, it would be core temperature. Yeah. You know, you're, you're as the, you know, it's your core temperature, maintaining your core temperature. That is what's going to be your fastest killer. So it's most important to me, you know, in any survival. So that covers fire and shelter. You know, first off, your clothes, and then and then whatever shelter you have out there, and so on. But if that answers his question, that's what I would say. Your, you know, fire and shelter skills to maintain your core temperature. Yeah, because that'll take you out of the fight real quick. Well, yeah, I I always, you know, a lot of. The rules of three, you know, a lot of people talk about them and stuff. What they are to me is they're, you know, three hours, you're not going to die, you know, but you but you can in certain circumstances. Other times you won't, you know, or whatever, right? So this, this threes are just an easy way for people to remember them and which order you should think about in any survival situation. What's most important right now? Okay, I'm, I'm lost. I checked over my gear. And now what do I got to do? What's most important? What's going to kill me the quickest? First, core temperature. Hypothermia or, you know, hypothermia, getting too hot. Those are going to kill you the quickest. So you have to address those. And then it's dehydration, but you, they say you can last, you know, three days, whatever, but then it's dehydration and then it's food. So that's the order you want. Maintain your body, your core temperature, and then you have your water and then you have your food. So that's the way I perceive every survival situation. Oh, you're spot on, Wayne, because we, we just did a modern mountain man rendezvous and one of the gentlemen there lives down in Borrego. And, uh, that's a large desert. It's the right, he li, he lives right up a butts near the uh, uh, Borrego um, Desert State Park. It's the largest state park in the United States. It's huge. Yes, sir. And uh, he was talking about already, Wayne. This year, four people have died. Wow! From one not having enough water, and it got yep. too hot, and from yep. exposure. But on yep. on on the heat side already. And you wouldn't think spring or winter time, but they're all going out there to the desert flowers. Hey, we got to take a photo and we're, we're doing this. They don't have any water. They're not dressed for the adventure. They don't have any, anything in their pack to help them out. I, yeah, you can be more right on that. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, and that's the thing. You can overheat just as quick as you can get hypo, you know, hypothermia. Well, yeah, yeah we, cold, so. we were high desert. We were at probably 3,500 feet. So during the day, it was getting in the mid to high 70s, but at night, it got down to 29 degrees. Yeah. yeah. So if you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt, yep. all of a sudden, you got hypothermia, and you probably freeze to death. Yep. And see, in a desert, that's the thing with, uh, you know, your core temperature still is first. You don't want to get too hot because that's going to cause dehydration quicker. You know, you're going to dehydrate a lot quicker because of the hot, you know, the hot wind blowing over you and, you know, drawing the moisture out of you and so on and so forth. So you need your water. So in the desert, you need shelter from the sun and you need water for dehydration. So every situation is different, you know, up here in the north in the wintertime. I, I have snow that I can melt, 
you know, so there's a water source right there. So you're lucky in the winter whenever you have snow. But, you know, it's shelter and it's fire. To me, it's always shelter first. Yeah. Because if I can get myself out of the wind, that's going to keep me warmer first off. You know, uh, a fire, sure, but if it starts freezing rain all of a sudden, now I'm soaked. I got a fire that's going out, but I had no shelter. So for me, I always put up my shelter and then I work on fire. But that's, you know, according on the situation again and, and who you are, I guess. But the, for me, that's what I that's what I do. Well, e- even breaking down in the desert, shelter would probably be number one because, you know, the yep. sun at noontime during the summer out there in Borrego, it might get a buck 15 to a you know, buck 20 in some spots in some of those canyons and the air. So dry, yeah. it, it, you'll be a raisin in no time. Yeah. You know, just- and that's the thing. Exactly. And you know, just those, uh, mylars, I wouldn't, I wouldn't use, I don't like a mylar. So I have a blanket because they rip too easy, but I have other ones. And, uh, you know, if you turn those, so it reflects the sun. Yeah. It can keep you cooler as it, well. It's, it's good. You know, so. It's good to keep it in a pocket. It's better than nothing. Yeah. 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 You know, um, we got a couple questions here. Let's see. And this question is probably because they've seen you wear like a, um, like a field jacket. Daniel on the YouTube side wants to know if you've served in the military in, over in Canada. No. No, I have not. I, I've never been in the military. Uh the reason I wear military gear is it's all surplus and it's proven, you know, it's proven to last. And if I can go buy a jacket for $20 that has already lasted me three or four years compared to something I buy at a department store that I pay $40 for and it lasts a year. And I don't care if this $20 jacket, you know, gets dirty right? kind of thing. And I know it's going to last. That's why I use a lot of the military gear. It's because it's proven and it works. And it's I'm on a budget like everybody else. Heck yeah. Because we ain't getting rich doing the YouTube gig. Contrary to what <laughs> <No. laughs> <Just, laughs> <No. laughs> Especially now that the ad revenue has been cut big time. Oh, yeah. yeah. But, you know, it, it, I don't do it for the money. I do it just because I, I love showcasing stuff and I just love making videos. I have a passion for that. But uh, you're right about the gear. You know, I, I found uh, a British uh, a windproof smock on eBay with desert camo for like 20 bucks. You know, nice. if, if you had to buy Pantagonia and not knocking that, if they're a potential sponsor of the channel or North Face or whatever, but you're going to pay 200 bucks, 250 bucks. You could put all that money, turn it around, put it into gear, put it into a good knife put it in a good fire making kit or a sleep system. And now you've, you've just made your experience a whole lot better for going out again and again and again, you know, a, a lot of people, you know, you, and you see this too. They always run out. They always got to go buy the top notch stuff. They spend all this stuff. Then they use it one time and, Oh, I didn't like doing that. And now they don't use the gear ever again, you know, and that's where some of the gear like that, the surplus gear, you know, you can save a buck or two. And, and then if, if it's what you really like, then you invest later on in, in a better piece of kit. I'll tell you a good example of that is now I seen on YouTube people using hammocks for camping. I never heard of it. Okay. So, and I seen people making them. And my little town that I was living in at the time, you couldn't buy sill nylon, you couldn't buy paracord or anything like that. Never heard of it, right, in that town. So I'm thinking, what can I use? What can I use? So I went out and I had a poly tarp and I doubled it over. It was a 10 by 12, I doubled it over. So it was 10 feet long and six feet wide. And then I bunched up the ends, wrapped some rope I had, quarter-inch rope around it, tied it to the trees, and it worked for a hammock. And I showed it to my friend, 
And me and him camped for a year or so with that until in across the border in the U.S. in Walmart over there, they had a equipped hammock for twenty four ninety five. That was my first ever real hammock. But I used that tarp, you know, for many, you know, a long time. I'm not quite sure how long. And then I, you know, put a video of a quick, easy hammock. Now, a lot of people have tried a tarp to camp in and see if they would like sleeping in a hammock. So it gave them an easy, cheap way to see if they actually enjoyed a hammock and if they'd want to buy one. So, you know, that stuff like that makes it yeah. worth sharing. You know, and then I came up with the feed pod because I noticed there is the double part. I figured if I lift this up and if I can lay in the bottom of this without tearing through, you know, I could have a roof and everything right in one. So I laid in it and I was made sure I was close to the ground in case I ripped through it. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> I laid in it. It didn't creak. And uh, so I put a little bit more pressure in it. And all of a sudden, oh, this is pretty cool. And I bounced up and down. It didn't go through. Now, I in one time, I had an older tarp, and it did start to rip up top where the, um, where the rope was. It started to rip a little bit. But other than that, I've never had a problem with it, and I always tell people, you know, test it, and they're safe. Don't put it over a bunch of jagged rocks and try laying it, you know, in case yeah. you fall through. So it's like any hammock, right? But anyway, I, yeah, that's, by sharing that stuff, you help people out, right? Take, take all the sharp objects out of your back pockets for you. Oh, yes. For yep. you up in there. Yep. yep. <laughs> that would not be good yep. at all. Hey, I have a question from David. Um, he wants to know, uh, where do you buy gear in New Brunswick? What, what's your biggest like gear outfitter out that way? You know, over here we have REI and we have a couple, couple other stores that you can go to, but wh where do you normally get gear to outfit yourself for going out in the bush? I have a local army surplus. Oh, okay. And that's where I, that's where I've got most of my gear. And then, you know, I do reviews and I use the gear that I get in the reviews. And that's where I've actually equipped myself now is by doing reviews, you know, and such and using the gear. Now, all the gear that I've had, I've tested and used it and used it and used it. And that's basically how I'm equipped now for, you know, for my campouts. Uh, don't really, I go to Amazon once in a while and buy stuff from there. And I shop online. There's really no place in my town besides Canadian Tire that I buy, you know, very, very, uh, like Walmart, okay? Same kind of selection. And that's what you get in the, you know, stores around here. Yeah. So anything, you know, you have to either go online and buy it or, you know, I like I said, a lot of it. I get it from uh, the Army Surplus, but and I have got some through reviews. Yeah, that's one thing I like about your channel, that you're actually out in the bush using and demonstrating the project. You know, net the product, net, nothing's worse. And I'm not knocking the, the Talking Hands reviewers, you know, but a lot. I think a lot of folks like to see the stuff actually being used out in the area that it's intended or designed for. Uh, the thing is with me, um, I put on the, say I'm doing a knife review. I use a knife the way I'm going to use it in the bush. And I will beat on it and beat it through a piece of log just in case I would have to sometime just to test the strength, but I'm not going to throw it at a rock. You know, or I'm not going to, you know, be prying on it and such that I know would break any knife. I'm going to use it exactly the way the knife was meant to be used. And if it holds up, then it's a good knife. You know, if it's comfortable and it, it's holding up good, you put it, you push it to its limits, but you don't, you know, it's a knife. It's, it's metal. If you pound that into a tree and start reefing sideways on it, 90 percent of knives are going to break tip off right you know so i don't do that you know it's 
and so on and so forth. So use gear the way it's supposed to be used. You know, same thing as a sleeping bag. Here's a, here's a good deal. Uh, most sleeping bags, I don't care what it is, the zipper will snag once in a while. So when you're zipping up and if it snags, take your time and unsnag it by pulling it back down and then zip back up. But if you just rip that, you know, and grab and just rip it up through and you rip it, it's not the product's fault. It's misuse. Basically, you know, it's it doesn't mean it's a bad zipper. It means you didn't take your time, you know, kind of thing. So use your gear, you know, like it's you want to keep it, <laughs> you know, basically. No, no, you're exactly right on that. You know, I, and I'm just as guilty as everybody else. Sometimes you're cold, wet and hungry and you get frustrated. Something's not going the way that you would like and all of a sudden you just try to bull your way through it and wind up tearing it or breaking it. I, I, I'm pretty good that way. <laughs> um, my mama taught me <laughs> when I was younger. Uh, I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I had a bicycle. I was trying to put the chain on. Every time I'd put it on, I'd start it and it would fall back. It'd fall back off. So I'm trying to tighten the chain. And it just would not go right. It would not go right. And I had a hammer in my hand. Well, I started beating on it on the back tire. And all of a sudden, I'm probably about eight, nine years old. And the mother comes up. She looks at me and says, what are you doing? The darn thing won't work. She goes, yeah, look at your bike. I looked at it. She goes, now what are you going to ride? And I just looked at it. <laughs> oh, and I learned right there. I learned right there. Yep. yep. Now I destroyed my bike, and what did that get me? <laughs> so yep. yeah, I'm pretty good at uh, yeah controlling, basically. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I learned my lesson right there. Uh, mom, moms do know best. Yep. Yep. My bike was <laughs> trashed, and. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Got a question from David. Goes. Uh, how many knives do you recommend taking on a trip, and which ones do you recommend? How many knives? Yeah. That depends on you. <laughs> that really depends on you. Myself, I take one knife. I take one knife, and I'll go, you know, one night, I'll go two nights. I only need one knife, and I take a saw. I'll take uh, either my Big Boy 2000 Silky, or I'll take my Boreal 21, or my Resourceful Redneck, you know, 18 or 24 inch. You know, I'll take one of those because with those, I can saw my firewood, and with my knife, I can baton, I can cut anything I need, I can carve anything I need, I can do it all with my belt knife. Because I use, and I usually have a 52 or I'm carrying my, you know, prototype of my survival bush point. So that's what I use. But it depends on him. Now, there's people that like to go out and do a lot of carving and such. Um, you know, and say it's spoons. Well, take your spoon knife if you like. I mean, you can't really say how many you should take. A lot of people say, well, you might lose your knife. Well, I, you know... I am very cautious with it, and I know it's my only knife. I could lose it, and it would be a bummer, but what can I say? I, I don't carry a backup knife. And usually when I'm going out, I'm not going, you know, 50 miles back in the bush. I have to walk where I go, so I'm usually going out, you know, two, three miles in the woods. Right. So I know if I lose my knife, I'm walking back out. You know, and I'm all, and I always have cell service as well. So I, where I go, I'm lucky that way that I do have cell service. And if I got in trouble, you know, I could use my phone if it worked, you know, kind of thing. If it, yeah, you know, lucky. And it, you're lucky in New Brunswick in that regard. Cause yeah. over where mom lives in Portage Lake, you get a mile, a couple miles from town and I'll, you don't have any cell service at all. Yeah, see that. See there, you're taking more of a risk. Yeah. Because then you don't have. I have a lifeline, and I mean, I make sure it's always charged before I go out. And I actually carry a uh, the C2, I believe it is, by Through Night. You know, the little battery charger. 
I carry that with me as well so I could charge my phone if I had to if I was over there overnight or whatever and it started to die my battery well I could charge it so I always have backup in that way but as for knives I you know it's up to you if you don't like big knives carry a machete and a small knife or something like that it's it's all up to you what you prefer really hey you got a question from Rob Ricks he says um, do you feel the bushcraft skills are relatable to urban settings in the event of a prolonged grid down situation. I am a carpenter by trade. And to be honest, I think that being a carpenter relates to bushcraft skills. And I think that, you know, because you do a lot of problem solving and such and making things and different, you know, different things. And if you have that mindset of creating with bushcraft, especially you're working with your hands, you're creating things, same thing as carpentry, you're, you're working with your hands, you're creating things. Uh, I'm also, you know, backyard mechanic, you know, I, I'm a jack of all trades. So does bushcraft relate to, urban type i would i would say i i would say yes because you're still you're in that mindset of if you're making something in bushcraft well you're gonna you're gonna have that creative mindset i i you know i would say and you'd have that same creative mindset for whichever situation you're in you, you know like what would you say about that you know what i mean like i i think it all it's all related really yeah, you know, um, skills are skills. I mean, yeah, that's why I tell folks, you know, when they say, well, I can't go to the mountains like you do or can't do that. And I go, well, do you have a backyard? Do you have a patio? You could go out on your patio and carve a tri stick. Yeah. You know, and, and learn, learn some knives handling skills there. You know, I'm sure you could find a local park that has like a barbecue grill and you could go to local park and work on some fire skills. Yeah, you might look a little weird with your ferro rod out there in the middle of a park, but you know, you, you use what you have where you're at. Yep. And then when you're in a situation, you know, like we were talking about earlier uh, before we came online where you were camping and you got a fire going last night and it was colder than heck you know you own those skills you, you have the confidence to get her done yeah skills are skills like you say and as in bushcraft i mean it's it's hard to say you're not going to go out there um you know in an urban setting or whatever you don't need to make a tripod for cooking you know kind of thing you know even if right. you know but if he's talking about you know out in the country or whatever in the bush or whatever well you could make yourself a fire pit out back or whatever you know so it's it's hard to you know answer that but i would say i think that it it all creates a way of thinking of you know solving a problem of what your needs is that's what bushcraft is if you need a spoon you grab a, a log and you carve a spoon, but that same log can be tinder, that same log can be a bowl, that same log can be this and that. And you get this creativity, you know, creativity, and it works in all ways of life, I believe. I hope that answers his question. Is <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. I I I definitely agree with that. Uh, let me see here. I got a question from David. Goes with insect in with insects, especially mosquitoes and black flies that are a concern. How do you deal with them? Now, I know that the moseys can drive you crazy up where you're at, especially during that spring thaw. How do you how do you keep from going crazy? Remember, uh, you grew up in the country, right? Yeah. When you was a kid. You, same thing as me, I'm pretty positive your parents didn't buy bug spray 
and you came in, your head, your neck, everything was nothing but bumps from bug bites. Yep. I mean, your head was nothing but bumps, your back, your neck, everything. But you was a kid, and you just kept going. When one bit you, you swat it, and you keep going. You get used to it. Now, what can I say if you're not used to it? I use, myself, I use off with a lot of deep. I mean, deep's not good for you. But if you're out there all the time, I would, you know, it's not good for you. But if you're out there once in a while, I, you know, that's up to you if you want to use it. But I use bug spray. But I also wear long pants and long sleeve shirts. Anything that I can cover up with, you know, uh, so the only thing they're biting is my hands, my neck, and my face. And like I said, half the time I don't even feel it anymore because we're somewhat immune to it, really, you know, from being bit so much. Do you, do you find that okay. the D affects your gear at all? I only, um, no, because I don't, I don't spray it on my gear. I, I don't spray it on my clothes. The only thing I spray it on is just my exposed yeah. skin. And that's because that's all they can bite, right? They can't bite through my clothes and such or whatever. So I just, you know, spray my back of my hands, spray my face, you know, spray my hat, and that's it. Yeah, we used to use this stuff called musk oil. It was kind of like a brownish yeah. oil yeah. that you used to put yeah. on you and rub yeah. on, especially yeah. when you're fishing for the yeah. most flies get you. They, they, that works good too. Must go anything with a lot of deed actually. That's what that's what I always use. Now I did. I have a video of it. I made a insect repellent from what was it? It was yarrow, uh, Labrador tea, and fern. Which which fern? Bracken fern. And mix those all together, all the leaves, and put them in a olive oil, and put and just cover them with the olive oil, and then set that in the sun for like like two weeks or whatever, and let that get all the uh, you know turn into a concoction, and then you could spray that on, and the oil keeps it on your skin because all of those, if you take if you take yarrow. And you just crush it and rub it on you. It works for a little bit. Same thing as uh, Labrador tea leaves and uh, bracken ferns. They're all supposed to be natural insect repellents. Now that's what I've heard, and I tried that, and I actually did a video, and I had them land on me, and there's like probably about 50 all around me, you know, up here, and they're landing, but they're but they're taking off again. It wasn't biting me. But you gotta apply that more often as such. But you know, they also say birch, tar, and stuff like that there, but that's you know, just black as a boot in your <laughs> you know, but they use that and they use bear grease and stuff like that back in the day, but and mud will work as well. But uh, a lot of times, like I said, I just spray my exposed skin and I wear a long sleeve shirt and pants so I don't have to uh, wear as much and they can't bite through it. Yeah, you know, um, when you're in that mud season, the moseys are just going to be everywhere. But, you know, it's only, what, two months, three, three months. Then you get a month of summer, then it starts fall again. But Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have black flies too. Eh? We got those little black flies, and uh, that's what usually comes out first. Yeah, black flies, and then they'll die off, and they, you know, and the, and the mosquitoes come out with those, and so on and so forth. But a lot of times, I mean, you don't even feel them. And uh, I remember going camping with one one fellow, and he, they were buzzing, and in you know, there's there's probably ten around our heads and stuff, right? But they weren't biting; they were landing and stuff. One once in a while, they'd bite. We had bug spray. But just the sound of them going and stuff, it was actually, you know, it was making him very irritated and so on and so forth. I'm like, dude, you know, it ain't going to take that much blood. <laughs> like, <laughs> no big deal, right? You know. But, yeah, I've, yeah, I've seen people, I, I don't want to say go insane because I don't think I've ever seen anybody go insane. But yeah, I've, seen yeah. go, I've seen them go crazy town. You know, yep. they're fishing yeah. and they just can't take it no more and they have a breakdown. Yeah. yeah. 
But, uh, you know, that that's like the old man said, you know, you, you dress for the weather. You don't dress to impress. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I got a quick question for you. Um, I, I was always interested to see uh, what or who was your biggest influence in bushcrafting? What got you like that spark to do what you do? See, I, I, I never, I didn't know, I didn't have any, uh, you know, any heroes or anything else. I, I didn't have anybody. I mean, around here, there was nobody until, you know, a couple years ago that does it around here. Uh, and then I met Peter. I mean, and he's he's into it. So I started taking him out and stuff. But what got me into it is I grew up in the country. And as you know, always hunting and fishing, right? As a teenager, I was doing it alone. And as you know, we have moose, we have coyotes, we got bear and such. And also we have Canada. So the weather and, and the forest and such, right? But so I basically, I started, I found a book in the school library about survival. Because if I ever got lost out there, I wanted to learn how to survive. And I started doing stuff from there. And then I was always camping in the bush. I was making shelters and stuff. You know, me and I had two brothers and stuff. We're always making shelters and camping and so on and fishing and stuff. So it was just playing for us. And it just grew, you know, and I kept on picking up stuff as the Internet started. Then I started seeing new stuff that I could try, and I'd go and do those, and so on, and just kept on going. So the spark has always been there because I'm a country boy, you know. Hey, you can't take that out of the man, you know. You can take him out of the country, but you can't take the country out of him. Well, I live in the city, but I still have a fire pit in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. Now, you know, being in St. John, how far do you have to go, say – before you're in the woods, you know, 10 minutes. I'm very lucky. Drive? I'm very lucky because actually being in St. John, I only have to drive 15 minutes and then I walk two miles in and there's not a house for, you know, probably five miles one way and then, you know, south of me and then probably almost 70 miles that way and 50 miles, you know, it's, it's very secluded where I go and it's only a 15 minute drive, but I have that major highway that goes by there that I have to drive to get there. And I walked back two miles, well, two kilometers the other day to do my last video that I just released. And I, walked up the old road there and stuff and I'm waiting a foot of snow and I and I finally get to this spot and and it's a hill it's big it's a, you're way up on top of the mountain and not mountains you know big hills and uh, you know and it goes down like this but it's on the south side and so it's got the sun and it's melted the snow there so I'm loving it and I could still hear the traffic I and I don't have you know I have to walk everywhere I go and to do a video yes you hear traffic in my video because usually I go a mile or two miles because I gotta walk it you know and a lot of times I'm waiting snow or doing whatever and stuff and I don't feel like you know going ten miles back in the bush and then yeah. hiking ten miles back you know do a video so hey I'm getting old that, <laughs> with that you had. Uh, you like to do a lot of camp cooking in your videos. Do you have like a favorite meal that you like to prepare when you're out there? I think that, uh, yeah, one of, one of the favorite would be cooking meat on the coals. That gives a flavor like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you have you ever... You must have done that, eh? A pork chop or a piece of steak directly on the coals? It's It's been quite a few years, but, yeah, I did it when I was in the Scouts up there in Maine. It gives – the flavor of that is, you know, 
Yeah, I, I, I love it. That's one of my that's one of my favorite. But I love any kind of cooking out there. Um, a lot of times I'll just take noodles and uh, some Lipton cup of soup, you know, and I'll just I'll mix those together, or I'll take tuna and noodles, or you know, whatever. Right. I, I'm usually out there at 24 hours or so anyway, so I'm not eating it like for days and such. So I made I made some pretty crazy stuff out there, and it's always it's always fun. Hey, you got one of the viewers giving you a hard time. Uh, got Jacket Mountain. He says Wayne's still walking because he destroyed his bike with a hammer. He goes, talk about a life lesson. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still walking, yeah. <laughs> See, note, note to self, kids, don't destroy your bike with dad's hammer. Yeah, don't, yeah, you learn real quick, like, you know, oh, man, what did I do that? So, you know, I never freak out about, I usually, I'll walk away if I get frustrated. <laughs> but, yeah. Yeah, I had to read that because that was funny. <laughs> uh, a viewer named Daniel has a question about physical fitness. He says, what about physical fitness? Do you believe it plays a role in survival? Indeed. Huge, huge. Actually, um, if you are not able to say you got to build a shelter, there's a lot of work to build in the shelter. And if you're not able to go and gather or even have the strength to be able to lift up whatever you're going to need and so on, you, and the endurance. I mean, you have to have endurance running back and forth, getting all the, you know, and chopping and so on and so forth. You have to have endurance. I mean, I'm, I'm fair shape, but I'm not, you know, in the best of shape either. But I do what I got to do out there. And the thing is, is that you, yeah, it, it plays a huge role. You know, someone said one time, in one of my comments about I was talking about survival and stuff and they said yeah but what if your arm was broken or something so try that then well I'll tell you one thing there's no guarantee that any of your skills will save you and you know in certain certain uh, situations if I have a broken leg I'm not gathering wood I'm not making a shelter I'm laying in that one spot and trying to call for help and you know whatever because if you if you never broke your leg and you try to get up and so on and so forth i mean you're gonna lay there a while before you actually force yourself to get up so you're you know it's it's all determined but it does it does make a uh, you definitely want to have the stamina to be able to do what you've got to have have to do in, in survival you know if you have to climb down a bank to get water you know, if you have to gather a bunch of firewood, if you if you can only walk, you know, 20 feet and you're out of wind, well, that's going to affect, you know, it's going to affect you. So, yeah, it, 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 you have to be in some kind of shape. I mean, it's going to help for sure. Uh, we got the smoking ape uh, checking in. He wants to know uh, what sort of medical kit do you carry and if you could talk about it a little bit right now I have a medical kit uh, from light take actually I believe it was and it's just your generic it has a few band-aids it has a bandage it's got um, some of the bigger bandages and I think it has one elastic strap for a sprain or something. That's that's about it, and some tape to tape the bandages. That's about it. Um, to be honest, this one here, it's all up to the person. This one here, it can there can be a lot of controversy about this. Um, with medical kits, you've got to think of what you're going to be able to do out there. My personal opinion. If I bust my leg, I'm calling on my cell phone. I am done. I mean, I can sure I can put a splint on it or something like that there. With I can grab paracord and uh, a stick or whatever, make a splint or something like that there. Um, if I'm choking, I you know 
my first aid kit ain't going to help me. If I just lacerated myself real bad, then, you know, you definitely want a first aid kit for that. But you've got to think, you know, what are you going to actually be able to fix with first aid kits? And that's usually slices and cuts and bruises and such or whatever. That's about all you're going to fix with, you know, anything that you've done to yourself really that is life-threatening. A first aid kit pretty much, you know, unless it's, big bandages the clot wounds and stuff it's usually cuts and scrapes you know that you're going to actually be able to cover now longest time tell you the truth i never carried one and that's because if i get a big cut i'll grab some stagnum moss and i'll st stamp into it if i get a little boo-boo or cut i'll use fur resin if i you know there's, there's many different things I use naturally or whatever as well, but a first aid kit is definitely a good thing to carry. And I started carrying it, especially in my first aid kit, because it's a lot easier and a, a bandage is going to be a lot cleaner than sphagnum moss and so on. So it's, it's a good thing to carry one. But you got to remember, too, it's still limited. Unless you have somebody with you and uh, – then if you're choking, if you're doing, you know, someone can help in that way. But yeah, I, I hope that answers his question about first aid kits. Uh, I only have a basic one because mostly all I'm going to do is I've got a bandage, a big bandage that I can, you know, claw a big wound and then boo-boos is about all else you can fix really, you know, yourself when you're out there. I like your, um, I like your statement where you said about the moss and the, and the pitch and stuff like that. Cause I, when I interviewed Matt Graham a couple months ago, he was asked the same question and he said, when he goes by himself, he doesn't carry a first aid kit because he knew enough about medicinal plants and living off the land from being out there so much that he, he just felt that he didn't need to bring one with him. Now, if he's going out there with, you know, um, teaching a class that's another thing yeah, yeah. but um, you know there a lot of people are forgetting the old ways you know there wasn't first aid kits a hundred years ago you know there yeah. there was somebody used a, a cotton bandana and whatever they could get you know in the wild off that well there's you know I, I know a way to if I have an upset stomach I know I know how to you know, fix that. If I got a headache, I know a few plants that will fix that. If I've got a cut, like I said, a uh, you know, fur resin is a you know polysporin of the woods, you know, kind of thing. So, and it will help seal up the wound as well. And then sphagnum moss is antibacterial as as well. Like you can you know put that in there. Of course, you're going to use the clean side, not the dirty side, of course. You know, and you can wrap a cloth around that. It you can you know get by with. But the thing is, is that you don't always have those on hand at that time where you're at. So carry a first aid kit, if, you know, as well. So because you could be looking around for sphagnum moss, and you may be in a square area where there is none, you know, or or fir tree. <laughs> It'd be the one time that I find a hardwood grove, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> You got one of your fellow St. John neighbors uh, checking in tonight, a gentleman by the name of Craig Betts. Okay, Says, yeah. uh, he goes, he's on the east side and Wayne's on the west. He goes, he follows all your videos. Yeah, yeah. Every, every one of them, he's, he's there and he comments, and I really appreciate it. There's welcome a few. What's that? Welcome aboard, Craig. Glad to have you here tonight. Yep, thanks, Craig. There's a, there's a few that constantly i mean you can pretty well always know that they're that they're there and they'll comment and such and and you do you you really uh get a you know you have a relationship with them basically you know and you, you can almost count on them always being there and you appreciate it for sure Heck for the yeah. support and knowing that you know that they like what you're putting out and you know and then the comments of them telling you that they've tried this or that and stuff and and it's worked for them and that's what it's all about for me is sharing and helping people out that's you know yeah you know that 
that's the great thing about the community that we're in. And I, I saw a lot of that at the rendezvous that we went to last weekend. Um, there was a lot of different walks, people from all different walks of life. And yeah. everybody shared a common love for the outdoors. Everybody got along. There wasn't any drama. And uh, we all had a heck of a good time, you know, and that's pretty much the community that we're in on our side of YouTube. And uh, yeah, they, there's going to be a little bit of infighting about this or that or whatever, but for the most part, people are really cool and it made a lot of cool friends too in the process. We have the uh, gathering, their annual gathering. I went down to it last uh, summer in Nova Scotia there again this year in August. And I can't wait to go down there because, you know, I met people that has been watching my channel and I've watched theirs and, you know, and all this stuff like that there. So you do, you get to meet and shake the hand that you, you know, talk to for years and such. And it's, it's always a good time for sure. Well, we're coming up a little bit over an hour. If you folks, we're going to wind down here in a few minutes. If you folks have any, more questions, post them up real quick and we'll try to do a quick rapid fire round. Um, got Mike Fuller checking in. He's wondering, um, do you carry a car kit? Obviously the weather gets a little extreme up where you're living and uh, you might want to have a kit in a car. If you do, how does the weather affect your kit as well? Uh <laughs> The reason I'm chuckling is because, you know, uh, I don't. And, you know, there's, I usually have in my car, I have my boots, I have a jacket, I have a blanket and such, that, and hat and mittens, and they're always in my car. Because a lot of times I'll just go and jump in my car and I'll drive to where I'm going out to the woods and I already have my boots and my jacket and my hat and mitts right in my car and I'll just go from there. But if I do strike off and go down the highway, um, you know, and if I did break down or whatever and I got chilly until, you know, help came, then I could wrap the blanket around me and so on, right? So, and in my wallet, I have, if, I have ways to start fire and such if I, you know, want. But my car kit, I always have my tools in my car and so on and stuff like that, as in mechanical tools and stuff. So there's really nothing more that I need really for my car besides stay warm. Well, in essence, that that's a kit in and of itself, though. Yeah, and the thing is, though, you got to remember too where you are and what you do. Up here, it's stay warm. You know, um, and and if I break down, I'm on a major highway where there's cars going by me all the time. All I got to do is go out and, hey, flag them down or use my cell phone. Or I'm just driving around, you know, town. So I don't really need a car kit. But if you're talking about someone going 200 miles and there's only a car that goes by once in a while and they're in the desert area, they're gonna going to want to supply themselves with a bunch of water in case. You know, <laughs> water, right? So. It all depends, but myself, I, like I said, I just have a few, in case I get cold or whatever, I can cover up. That's about it. But, like I, um, I had a kit that I had in my car when I was commuting 105 miles every day, and I, and I did a test on this kit because a lot of people don't realize how hot a car gets. You know, you get a thermometer in a car, if it's in the high 90s that day, the car might get 120, 130, even a little bit higher in temperature. Yep. And how that affects your medical kit with band-aids and tape and, and such, and even uh, like bottled water in the car. I was thinking, how is that plastic uh, holding up where it's getting – you know, 120 degrees, 130 degrees every day, then cooling down at night and getting, you know, how I think in my head, how long should I leave these bottles of water in there before I either drink them or water the plants at home with it? You know, it's in your situation, it's so cold, it could have the opposite effect too. 
because cold on my med medical tape and such it might not stick after a while actually um I, we've had a small like little first aid thingy or whatever in the dash first aid kit and they had band-aids and stuff and it. they're fine um it doesn't affect that uh but see we couldn't leave bottles of water in there because it'd freeze in the winter time right you know and the thing is is that i wouldn't keep my kit in the car anyway you know say you leave water bottles in your car i'd have them when i needed them i'd take them out and throw them in the car and go and then when i got home i just bring them in you know i wouldn't leave them in the car kind of thing right right but now if you're talking about See, the thing is, is that what kind of thing would you, you know, what kind of kit would you have for a car besides warmth, keeping your core temperature, and water? I mean, you really don't need fire unless you're going to walk over in the bush and make yourself a shelter and a fire and so on and stuff like that. So you don't really need that type of stuff. I mean, it's core, like I said, it's core where you are again. But a blanket is, you know, or water, really. You know, or even a sleeping bag. I've kept a sleeping bag rolled up, thrown in the back. And then if it does get cold, I can go up crawling that. You know what would be a good test um, for you to try out, Wayne, is I don't know if you follow along on Black Owl Outdoors where they had the Bic lighter that they left outside in the woods for like six months and they would go back like every month and check on it, see if it's still lit. Maybe, oh, yeah. maybe grab an item that we use every day and maybe a ferro rod or so leave, leave it out in an area that that you go to just laying on the ground somewhere and check on it every month and do a long-term test to see if that item would hold up if say you it fell out of your pocket and somebody found it eight months ten months from now and if they could still use it out in the bush that a would be ferro rod a ferro rod roll. I, I've had them. Uh, you know, they get damp. They rot. They start, you know, pitting and everything else, and they'll actually they'll they'll rust or rot or whatever you want to call it. Um, now I've heard that salt water will do it, but I guess I, I'm not sure what does it, but. They will. They'll, they'll start pitting and stuff. You must have seen it yourself. And, oh, yeah. and I've always thought it was just a dampness because I had one in my handle of my survival bush point underneath the paracord wrap. And I took that off and it was all pitted and such. And But I've had that handle wet and so on. And that's what I blamed it on, not salt water either. So I think that a ferro rod, if you just left it out, you know, it's going to. Uh, rust away now think about it a lighter i i've actually seen them along on a ditch and be able to pick them up but they'll start rusting as well you know it up around the the wheel and such and uh those those can also fail on you but hey I we don't can, know. <laughs> it, just some piece of gear be cool you know to see a long-term uh, study on something like that you know. Okay, I'll take a ceramic cup out there and set it down. <laughs> <laughs> I bet you that will last a while. <laughs> hey, you, know, you could always sharpen your knife with the bottom of it, so that would work. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure that would last a while. <laughs> hey, you got David. <laughs> David's in the comment section. He's wondering about not knowledge and how important it is to you, knowing how to tie certain knots. I did a video and on the knots that I use. I use about five different knots and variations of those. Very simple. Um, it's the same thing as primitive traps. I know quite a few primitive traps, but there's always one, the pipe deadfall, that is basically one that you can count on. So if you know that one trap and know how to set some snares, you're set pretty much. You don't have to know like hundreds of different, you know, because you just look at the situation of what you're going to be hunting and different things. Now with knots, I use a lashing for trying like tying tripods and such together. I use the 
I was told it's not a granny knot, but we always called it a granny knot. I used that when I used a Canadian jam knot, uh, the present knot, and I'm not sure what other one, but I use very few knots, and that's I've never had to. I, I was never in Boy Scouts. I would have loved to be, but we couldn't afford stuff like that. So you know, uh, we was I was never in Boy Scouts, and so I grew up what all the old fellows were used and what taught me. You know, that's all they used all their life, just you know, five simple knots. Yeah. Yeah. But I got a video of what how to make them and stuff and what I use, and they've always worked for me. Yeah, the best advice is just like you said, have five or six core knots that you're going to use and then cut a little hank of rope and just practice them. You know, you can practice them a couple nights a week there in the backyard or tying on a chair or whatever. And oh. that way you get out in the woods, you're good to go. Yeah, for sure. And that's the thing. I, I, I try to keep it simple. Um no one hundred different knots well my brain will get confused <laughs> you know if, if you're if you focus on certain you know just a small few things and you are really stressed in a situation your mind's going to be going but if you only know five instead of a hundred they can start jumbling up and you you'd be getting you know different so it's better just that's why i say the pipe dead fall is a trap that many have used and it's one of the most successful deadfall traps so if you know how to make that trap then with deadfalls you can pretty well use it with any deadfall and same thing as uh snare you can make uh the number seven notch and and you know your stake and then on your bent pole down to your uh other hook part put it there and you put your snare on it if you know that that's all you need to know for a snare, pretty much. You know, so if you only know just a few, I mean, I know a lot more, but the thing is, is that because I really enjoy doing them, uh, just knowing those few, they are go-tos, and it doesn't, it doesn't cloud your mind. You're, you're more focused, I find. Hey, I gotta, re I gotta get up close so I can do this tough question for you, Wayne. Here's one from the Smoking Eight. Now, a lot of people ask on other channels, boxers or briefs. We're not going to get into that on this channel. <laughs> but uh, the question is, Kydex or leather sheath? <laughs> <laughs> Curveball. <laughs> I got some flack about that one time. Because nylon, Kydex, any thermal plastic or nylon and such is the way to go for me. And the reason why is because I had a knife that was leather and my, I had 1095 high carbon steel and I went totally submerged in a lake. I came up, the knife is soaked, the sheath is soaked. I could not put my knife back in that sheath for two days until that dried out. Otherwise, I'm going to rust my blade all the heck. Wow. Now, if that was Kydex, half an hour, I could put my knife back. If that was nylon, just put it in the breeze, half an hour, you can put your knife back. That's why I prefer. And there's no um, maintenance. You don't have to oil them. They don't crack over time. They don't, you know, myself, i rather have thermal plastic Kydex nylon myself. Now, and speaking of that, n uh, knife maintenance, how do you treat your blades up there so they don't corrode, being that you're in a pretty wet environment most of the time? Myself, I keep them dry. <laughs> I mean, when I'm home once in a while, I'll uh, take some, actually, gun oil. I'll take a little bit of gun oil, spread over it if, you know, if I'm keeping it, you know, and not going out for a few days. But when I'm out in the bush, I will cut what I need. I'll wipe it off, wash it off, and then I'll wipe it on a uh, cloth or whatever, make sure it's perfectly dry, and then put it back in. As long as you keep it dry, it won't rust. You know, you just got to keep it dry. So you don't have too much of a problem with humidity and stuff like that up there with 
in the spring or the fall or not not with uh i mean humidity is high and such but it doesn't bother your knife i mean yeah with uh i just i keep it dry like i said but also what i'll do is a lot of times i'll just take some damp stagnant moss that i have everywhere <laughs> you know i'll wipe my blade off take my bandana wipe it off and i'll put it in my sheath and like i say if you have a leather sheath leather collects the moisture and yeah, that will true. be damp and you're going to put it in there and you're going to rust but if you have kydex if you have uh nylon i don't have that problem yeah leather looks nice but the practical applications of it you're right in regards to that yeah and that's that's why i guess i don't have the problems because i don't really use leather sheaths much not unless it's you know with the knife hey we're we're gonna wind it down let's talk a little bit about um what any future plans what you got coming up uh what's the best way for people to uh reach you that may have found you for the first time tonight i have my facebook page which is wayne call craven russell i have that and uh youtube you can check me out there call craven bushcraft and survival and that's that's about all I use really and then you have a website right where you, are you yes, still, I have, you still doing yeah, the, my, the videos where they could download yeah so I still have my website that's uh, called CraigBushcraft.ca and uh, but that's mostly a spot that I made the website so people could go there and purchase a lost or stranded survival series I had to have it someplace where they could go and they could download the videos. And I also put up a bushcraft uh, project series as well there that they can purchase on there just for people that would uh, like something different and, yeah. and uh, different yeah, I, projects and such. I, I did a review for Wayne on the survival series and I found that it was very informative. And uh, even if you're a seasoned veteran in the bush, there's always something that you can learn. Uh, I never take it for granted that I'm the end all and I know everything because obviously my wife and my daughter confirm that I don't know everything. But uh, I, I found your video series uh, very helpful, especially for folks that may not have someone that's able to take them out in the woods and they might be in and they might have a passion for it and you know what they're seeing on some of the shows on tv isn't like if you're going to really go out into the woods and i like how you broke it down by fire by shelter and you compartmentalized everything and you explained it really well and uh, what I'll do also on that, uh, on this video, I'll leave links to everything uh, down in the video description below. So it'll be like a one-stop shop uh, if folks are interested in that video series for you. Yeah, the re whole reason I made that series is because around here, um, we have a lot of hunter, fishermen, snowmobilers, four-wheeler, you know, stuff. And they'll, they'll take off and go 60 miles through dense bush you know and not see another person and stuff right and i was hoping that i could get it out to as many people as i can because it can save lives you know knowing this type of knowledge and learning how to do it by practice it can save lives as you know oh, yeah. and that's what i was hoping to try to get you know just inform people and get their interest into trying to learn this stuff so if they ever do get stranded how to signal for help how to set up shelter you know and so on and and how to act when you first know okay i'm, I'm lost what am i going to do well you go back to this same thing the rules of three you know you assess your situation first you assess yourself am, am i hurt no uh what do i have on me what can I do with this? Look around the surroundings where, 
you know, and such. And then you, okay, well, first thing, core temperature. I've got to regulate this core temperature. And then after you get your shelter and your fire, then you go on to, okay, I've got that established. Now I can look for water. Right. So I don't get dehydrated, you know, and then go from there. And then you start, you know, and you do some signaling and, you know, set up for signaling and so on such as well. So, Well, the thing that I immediately thought of when I saw a few of the videos is I was thinking about how many people, especially up where mom lives up there in Portage and probably out in your neck of the woods that are riding those quads out there on the trails. Yep. And it's easy to get 30, 40, 50 miles in the back country. And then all of a sudden that thing goes south on you. Yep. And nobody knows where you're at. You yep. know, th they'll know the general location, but the location could be 10 or 15 square miles. You got a search and rescue party. That's like looking for this pen and you just yep. move it out into a field somewhere. You know, you're just, it's going to be hard to find that. And uh, snowmobilers, same thing. How many people go yep. snowmobiling back on those old woods roads that are off established trails and just go. And then all of a sudden, you know, like, like me, when I was a kid, I hit a stump and knocked the front ski right off the snow, snow sled, you know, and, and, I and that's, and, wound up staying behind that's, you know that's yeah thing. and that's why you know i i created this just for that reason because and that's why i call it lost or stranded you know it's for survival if you're lost or stranded and even you know going over the kit and the kit that i made for like that kit i had to think of a way to with someone with very, very limited skills, you know, to start a fire and so on. And I tried to base it around, you know, almost every skill level the best I could. And having just that simple little kit with you and knowing those skills, you know, it could definitely save their life. And that's, that's what my purpose was. Hey, if folks are in the New England area, and um, they want to be able to go to that rendezvous in Nova Scotia. Do you guys have a page set up for that on Facebook or is there like a group? Yes. yes. Facebook. Facebook. Yeah. I, 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 um, I'll, I'll get that link from me and I'll put it in the video description yeah. on this as well. Case, you know, cause I know, I think Mitch uh, went up there last year, right? Yes, he did. Yeah. Yep. So, you know, obviously there's New Englanders that don't mind making the trip, which is a really cool drive. And, yep. uh, you know, uh, it's a good way to have fellowship and um, learn some skills, you know. That's that's what's cool about that. Hey, with that, I, Wayne, I want to thank you for coming on. I want to thank everybody who came on to the live show tonight. and. Um, posted your questions and crazy comments and stuff like that. I always have fun. Uh, missing my sidekick, Andy Tran. Hopefully next time uh, we can get him uh, on here. Yeah, that would have been cool. You know, we're uh, we're missing him here. This is the first live show without him, so I kind of feel like my uh, part of my arm's gone. So I miss my, my sidekick. But, uh, Wayne, I want to thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on. I know it's four hours difference from us out here on the West coast. Yeah. But, uh, with that, thank you. And I look forward to, uh, having you on the show again, uh, in the near future. Yeah. I want to thank everybody too. And I hope that I answered their questions. Uh, sometimes I may stumble a little bit. I'm trying to think at the same time how to present it, you know, <laughs> and get it across. Right. Because my mind's going a million miles, you know, and uh, such, and I want to thank everybody for coming along and checking it out. And I want to thank you too. I mean, we've been wanting to do this here for a while, and uh, it's been a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Yeah, finally, our schedules uh, were able to meet. You know, it's, yeah, yeah. You know, it, it's crazy times. You know, both of us have full time jobs and the YouTube channel and life, but uh, the stars aligned and we were able to make it happen. And with that, folks. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you on the next video. Take care. You have a good night.
take care.